and we're officially live, broadcasting only on OneDealAway.com slash live. This is Money Matters. My name is Nev. Good morning and happy Thursday to you. As you know, on Thursdays, we do talk about real estate and what's going on. News around the world, uh, predominantly U.S., but we do sometimes touch on the world, and we will today. So what are we going to learn today? Well, we're going to be talking, of course, about the mortgage rates and where they are. Of course, they're going, well, one direction that have been going ever since the pandemic started, and that is down. Um, of course, we're going to be talking about what is happening in the global macro perspective of real estate when it comes to both residential and commercial real estate. We're going to be talking about some problems and, of course, potential solutions. I have so much stuff to cover. It's not even funny. We're going to be talking about what's going on with the condos. We're going to be talking about single family and the most affordable places where you can go live. We're going to be discussing how to uh, you know, think through what's going on in real estate. Is it a big boom? Is it a big bust? And my argument is it's a little bit of both. It just depends on what and where. One of the things that we should always keep in mind is that real estate, while global concept, is very much localized. And of course, that is going to play a big factor here. While one city could be potentially going down, another one could be booming. Same thing goes with the different sectors within real estate. That, for example, we know that the retail, more likely than not, is going to come on crashing, and it is slowly but surely going that direction. However, residential potentially could be doing just fine over the long term. So we're going to be discussing all of those things. I hope you're excited. I am beyond excited to do this stuff. And uh, of course, that is what we're going to be discussing here. If you're watching this live on onedealaway.com slash live, do me a huge favor, sign in, say hello, and we're going to do Q&A at the end of the show as always. If you're watching this elsewhere, for example, Facebook or YouTube, uh, then do me a favor, smash the like button, forward it on to the people you think are going to enjoy the show, subscribe, hit the bell button, if that's something that exists, uh, of course it does on YouTube, so that you get notified because YouTube, frankly, doesn't care what you get. They will just deliver you stuff that has the most views, but you might not necessarily enjoy those shows. So if you're enjoying the show, if you're enjoying learning about these things, well, you want to hit subscribe button. That way you get notified when we go live, when new video posts, which is, well, just about every single day. Let's do this. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy Thursday to you. I hope you are very excited to be here. I know I am. And we're not going to waste any time whatsoever because I have a ton to cover. And we likely won't be able to cover all of it today. Otherwise, the show is probably going to run like six hours. And A, you don't want to watch this for six hours. B, I don't have that much time to do this. So we're going to break it down in chunks, in tranches, as they like to call it in the world of investing. So we're going to be covering news that I have covered here. And then tomorrow we're going to go even deeper because I have been up since about 2 o'clock this morning. Yes, I know. It's weird. I get it. But I have been. And so what I have been doing for the past, I don't know, five hours, four and a half, five hours, has been going deep into what's going on in the world of real estate because I am personally invested in it. I am also professionally invested in it. And so I wanted to learn as much as I humanly can. So uh, I was going to change the stuff, but clearly that didn't happen. All right, so let's take a look at the mortgage rates over here. And uh, here we are using something a little bit different because I tend to like graphs and charts better than just tables. And uh, we looked over the mortgage rate trends over the time. And you will see that this purple line right over here is the 5-1 arm, adjustable rate. And you can see that we were well well above four and a half, uh, not that long ago, only a year ago, that's where the mortgage was. And of course, you have the 30 here, which is this green, right? And then you have a 15 year, which is this blue. And you will see one of the interesting things that I've been talking about on this channel for a while now, 
that uh, we are noticing that you know arms are actually well below e 15 and 30 here which is unusual it's unheard of typically it's much um, it's 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 going above it and stuff but now it's actually way below so it's much more affordable to go um, you know with with an arm right now although I don't necessarily know that I recommend it because I never never recommend adjustable rate mortgage I know in the industry they say well if you plan on selling the home in five years or seven years just go with five or seven one arm well that sounds uh, really good to sell your mortgage however you don't know what your life is going to be like five years from now or seven years from now you may have plans to sell right now five years from now but your life very much can change i mean think about it 2020 alone when january came i don't think anybody envisioned that uh, in october we would be where we are right so maybe a few people had a foresight into it and thoughts into it if they were watching what's going on in china and that kind of stuff but most of us didn't have a clue right so now uh, our lives have changed right maybe you didn't even think that you're going to be moving out of a city or buying a home or that it's going to be this mad land rush happening in summer of 2020 when 2020 rolled around today we know that that is very much a reality so i think it's very important piece to to play around with this so here what i have done what i like about this one is that it gives you sort of if you purchase and credit rating and percent down and all that kind of stuff so we can play around with it and say well i'm going to put 20 percent down what happens well you will see that the charts have adjusted a great deal if i change it to refinance you will notice something very different also that you can see a very very steep decline over the last year of course we can also change it to say give me three months only i want to see what's going on in three months section and you will see what's been happening there's the five one arm and it's you know going sideways 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 it kind of went up it slipped back down and now it's going back sideways whereas the 15 and 30 year are clearly going down still of course we can make this to 740 and higher and you will notice that the rates are dropping even further so you can definitely play around with this um, if you want to you can find this on zillow uh, right and uh, here is the other piece they're talking about like choosing the best mortgage for you and of course it talks about different components but here is one of the really cool pieces that you can also monitor and i really like this i like it better than bank rate or anything else that i have found this morning that we can see where we are with the with the weekly rate change is it going up or down and you will see that uh, we have slight increase in the 15 and 10 year fixed rates right um, over the week um, however everything else is going slightly down and of course we are noticing um, oddly enough that uh, you know 15 year is cheaper than 10 year which doesn't make sense if you think about it but here we are a lot of things don't make sense in 2020 including the stock market right including what's happening with the mad land rush that kind of stuff so you will also notice one of the interesting pieces with the government loans and we're going to be talking a little bit more in detail uh, this morning about the government loans and the traditional loans and what's actually happening in the market so make sure you stay tuned for that uh, but here we are you will notice that the 30-year uh, fixed uh, rate FAJ is 2.28 it's way better than the traditional 30-year uh, right uh, traditional 30-year rate average is 3% whereas the 30-year uh, fixed FAJ is 2.28 of course with FAJ you might have to pay the the PMI the private mortgage um, insurance so that's going to increase potentially slightly but you put way less money down so even with for example you know 20% down on the traditional which you can see right over here I have to put way more money down to obtain a home which of course gets locked up in that equity so you can't access it and pay a higher rate or I can go with 3.5 percent down and get something as low as low two percent we've never ever in history of mortgages that I know of and uh, you know I've been looking for you know decades 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 in the past I've never seen or found anything that was this low um, 30 year fixed uh, VA is 2.5 slightly higher than the FAJ 
and uh, of course if you go with the 15 you get 2.25 so not a big difference for a giant difference in the amount of years you have to pay so again i always not that i'm making any financial recommendations and you shouldn't take any recommendations from anybody on youtube or anywhere else the only financial recommendations you should take is from yourself and potentially a financial advisor licensed professional who can actually tell you what to do but I always advocate for just go with the 30 year and if you want to pay make payments on the 15 year schedule you can but um, you know the the cool part about it if you do that is that you know you can still pay it off in 10 15 years but if something happens you have a longer runway right if I get a 15 uh, year mortgage that costs me say thousand dollars a month and all of a sudden I find myself in a situation where I can't afford thousand bucks but I can afford 500 I'm in pro I'm, I'm in trouble right because I can't afford to pay the whole thing now if I go with the 30 year that is 500 and I can afford to pay a thousand I can keep on paying thousand pay it off uh, right in half the time probably actually even less than that if I make by month or sorry by weekly not by monthly by weekly every other week payments I can reduce that to way less than 15 years uh, probably be about 12 13 years or something like that um, but if something was to happen I can always drop back down to $500 a month and I'm still current so that's the reason why I like this component and of course if we take a look at the jumbo rate program you will see that it is much higher than the traditional uh, component so this is a cool and interesting piece and of course we're going to continue looking at this stuff now I did promise that we're going to take a look at what is happening with the mortgage rates and the new applications because that gives us an insight into where the market is potentially heading now I have been saying for a while um, well when the whole pandemic whatever thing started right the pandemic of 2020 let's call it that uh, the beer overflow as I like to call it um, I have said that you know we're probably going to see a pickup come summer and into the fall and now I'm saying as we're entering winter months that is going to calm down now is it going to completely die off I don't know I don't have a crystal ball am I going to be 100% accurate probably not again crystal ball broke years ago um, but looking at this stuff that the uh, mortgage rates are falling to new records and uh, there are news about the whole thing so let's take a look and of course this is today is the 15th so this is as of yesterday so it's pretty darn fresh news mortgage rates in the United States have fallen to a new record uh, low but applications are down this is continuing that trend that we have been talking about that the applications it's starting to slow down so um, does that mean it's going to crash I don't know potentially uh, does it matter I don't know potentially for some people it might for others it might not make any difference whatsoever um, and I will explain in just a moment as to why it does or doesn't make any sense or might make the difference 30-year fixed rate mortgage with loans up to uh, $510,000 uh, declined 3% uh, last week applications for government mortgages are up 3% and 11% jump in VA refinance applications not new but refinance application volume however declined 0.7% refinance application declined 0.3 but are still of course 44% higher than they were in October 2019 so one of the pieces that I wanted to share with you is does it matter does it not matter so let's talk about why it does or does not matter so let me grab my trusty pen and let's draw and let's write so it does matter if you're if you're paying for a house right you have a house and you pay the house a uh, hundred thousand dollars right I know that's not the average but just you know it's easier math with hundred than with 350 or 370 thousand which is the median uh, home price in United States in 2020 as of uh, the date of this recording so let's say that this is kind of what happens but then it drops down say 10 percent right um, and I'm using 10 percent strategically because we're going to be talking about some of the predictions and so there's 10 percent that is mentioned so this is all going to make sense at the end of the show so you want to stay tuned in for that well this means that this particular house right here is now valued at ninety thousand dollars the problem is that if I have put 20% down meaning twenty thousand dollars into the whole deal I am uh, my you know equity is actually still staying there right so where it was 
20%, now it's actually going to go up. So I have more equity, but I can't access it because it's being eaten because of the price droppage. Now, where it might not matter as much is when we're talking about the investors. So to the investors, it might not necessarily matter as much because if you buy and you buy appropriately, which I do teach at onedealaway.com, which is, by the way, the sponsor of the show and has been sponsoring every single show. And this is why we don't have any commercials on the YouTube channel. So you are welcome. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if you if you buy it over here and if your income for this particular property is, say, $1,000 a month, right, and it's consistently coming in, does the price even matter? The answer is not really because if, if you are focusing correctly as an investor and you should be on the income and not the price of the particular asset, right? Price going up uh, in value is, you know, just a cherry on the top, but it's not necessary for me to actually draw on the whole thing. So if I have paid $100,000 for this particular house, like in a previous example, this means I am getting 1% of the investment right that's my that's my return on the investment right on the, on the monthly basis um, if it drops down to ninety thousand dollars right that means that i'm still making thousand dollars a month this means that actually this has gone up um, i don't know exact the math but you can probably do it and calculate it yourself so that's one of the reasons why i said it might or it might not matter it just depends on what lens, through what lens you are looking at investing in real estate. For me, I prefer to focus on the cash flow rather than the appreciation, whereas vast majority of the education when it comes to investing, uh, because it's so focused on the, um, you know, just stocks, 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 um, that the only way that you can actually benefit is if it goes up. Uh, what I'm saying is that while that is kind of cool, I don't want that to be the only game because it's not the only game in town. Now, talking about games and towns, it's time to revisit San Francisco and what's going on with commercial mortgage-backed securities. And like I said, there's a lot of news that we have to cover and kind of put it into this big component to understand what is happening. And we'll be covering a lot of stuff um, about commercial as well as residential. And so... For years now, I have been saying, you know, the, the commercials are not necessarily as hot as you might want to believe that they are or as much as the syndicators have been selling them. And the reason is that the prices have gone way up since about 2012 to 2015 that uh, just simply price versus what you get doesn't make sense. This is the same concept that we are seeing on any major metropolis and of course we're going to be talking about that stuff where it just didn't make sense to buy yet people were buying on the hope mentality of appreciation which is why i keep saying that's not the measurement you should be working off of it's definitely not the measurement that i am working off of um, but you know uh you you do you i do me um, and then let's compare the notes so let's learn Two Hilton properties, two Hilton hotel properties in San Francisco, Hilton San Francisco Union Square and Hilton Park 55 have now been added to the huge pile of hot hotel properties seeking relief on their mortgages. Both hotels are still closed, even though some have reopened in the city of San Francisco. And of course, the problem is the tourism and lack of visitation. Now, of course, tourism remains small, even though we've seen some slight uptick on people kind of wanting to travel and potentially potentially stay in hotels typically they're not staying in cities they're typically staying in more of a rural close to the outdoor places so it's like place to stay right and then you go out into the wilderness and of course one of the things that i've also seen this summer is that all of a sudden camping picked up a in a big 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 way Convention tourism is a huge factor in San Francisco and all in-person conventions and meetings have been canceled and converted to virtual. Now, what happens when the hotels uh, request the sort of like, hey, we need adjustment? When mortgages that were packaged into CMBS get in some sort of trouble and borrowers ask the loan servicer for relief, they're added to the servicing watch list. 
The mortgage is still current for these two hotels, but of course they're working with their bank, which is Wells Fargo. If the borrower and servicer cannot work out a deal, the loan is sent to a third party, the special servicer, and thereby added to the special servicing list. If the mortgage becomes delinquent, it is then added to the delinquency list. Special servicing rate for hotels properties spiked to a record of 26% at the end of September. Delinquency rate of hotel properties ticked down. However, some delinquencies were cured because the delinquent loans were granted forbearance and were therefore no longer considered delinquent, though no payments are being made. Stay on, and of course, you know, uh, even if they are granted forbearance, they stay on the special servicing list. So it is much better to look at special servicing rate as opposed to delinquency rate. And of course, we have a chart right over here that compares the two. So special servicing is this, uh, the red thing, right? Which you can see it went on up and it keeps on climbing, whereas delinquency rate went on up and then started to come down. So the delinquency rate basically is saying, well, we're not going to call them delinquent because we put them in forbearance. Now, why would they do this? Well, because it helps the bank because then bank shows that they have a much stronger um, assets uh, or sorry, balance sheet um, than, than they actually do. Same thing also happens for all of these REITs and hotels because they're not showing that they're in delinquency. And of course, now they're putting down that they're not necessarily making the payments, making their income appear much larger. So it's just a, a, a financial accounting trickery. It's legal, but uh, you know it's a trickery nonetheless. At some point, that's gonna have to be adjusted, but why worry about the future when we need to worry about today? When the mortgage is sent to special servicing, it will be repraised under the current conditions. According to the report by Fels, Wells Fargo, repraisals of hotel properties have been brutal. A Crown Plaza hotel property in Houston was reappraised 46% lower than appraisal in 2014. That is huge. That is huge. Imagine having a house that you purchased and it was appraised at 1 million and then you go and reappraise it today and find out that it's half a million, right? When this happens in residential mortgage, which is what happened in 2008, 9, 10, 11, right? It was a huge outcry because it was happening so prevalently. We're not talking about it as much because for most folks, they're not necessarily invested in these properties. They don't own these hotels, but they are technically invested in them and they're invested through REITs through their retirement accounts. Most people don't know that, but they should. And of course, tomorrow, tomorrow, make sure you tune in tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about these REITs and what's happening and what the large and smart money is doing when it comes to REITs. So it's very, very important for you to tune in tomorrow if you are in any way, shape or form invested in these puppies and more likely than not, you are if you have a retirement fund or a mutual fund or potentially even have purchased a REIT all on your own. So we're going to be taking a look into that tomorrow. So make sure you come in for that. Holiday Inn La Mirada in Los Angeles was marked down by 27% from its appraisal uh, in 2015. So we're seeing that the range is anywhere between negative 25 and negative 50%, which is a big, big, big drop. The REIT shares, which peaked in the fall of 2018, started heading seriously lower in May 2019, and by February 2020, were already down 30% from their 2018 peak and I believe that they will continue to go down. Again, I don't know what is going to happen, but you can see clearly right over here, this is park hotels and resorts, and you can see it's kind of like, you know, sideways, 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 and then boom, it dropped um, in March, and it's been kind of going a little bit sideways, slightly up, it's the trend is, if you look at the trend, right, it's slightly up, but I just, I just don't see it continuing to go that direction. Now, Wells Fargo has already agreed to provide le relief for park hotels, which is what we're seeing right over here. Uh, but while there has been some uptick in leisure tourism in cities and surge in tourism in near national parks, state parks, and other wonders away from the cities, convention tourism and business travel remains down. And of course, there's a huge difference when you and I go versus convention centers, right? So put yourself in the shoes, you've likely done it as well. When you go on your own, right? you maybe don't get the presidential suite maybe you enjoy the you know buffet or you try to figure out like 
all right, how do we how do we travel smart about the whole thing? Not everybody does that, but I would argue vast majority of individuals do. Now, when you go with a conference where the company is paying for all of that, of course, all of the meals included, you eat in the finest restaurants, you stay there the longest. If a uh, convention is there, we're talking, you know, thousands of people, sometimes tens of thousands of people that flood into the city, into the convention center. All of that is being spent in that city. So think restaurants, shopping, hotels, hotel services, right? Maybe you go in with the suit and you need to have that suit, you know, uh, freshened up. Well, that costs money. That convention has to book all of those hotel rooms. Those are not free. They sometimes serve meals. That's not free. So this is all of the stuff that hotels are used to getting that it's not happening. And the interesting piece that I didn't see, I, I don't see it here in this article, but that I read in one of the other articles, which we might see today. I can't remember what's in what article. Sorry about that. Uh, that uh, there are experts are basically saying that we won't see conventions pick back up until 2024. So what does that mean? Well, it means we still have solid three years before we start seeing the uptick into the hotels, into the restaurants, and into the airlines. So does that mean that there's more pain for these particular sectors? I argue yes. And of course, you know, you, you potentially could be saying, hey, airlines are a great buy right now. I don't know, based off of what I'm seeing, I'm saying it could be a great buy in 21, uh, late 21, or maybe 22, or maybe even 23, when they hit the rock bottom. Right now, it's still very much uncertain. I think everybody else has uh, a lot of hope, but um, you know, I don't, I don't think that we're out of the woods yet. I don't think we're getting out of this pandemic of 2020, which is probably going to turn into pandemic of 2020 through 2023. Um, the other reason that is also I'm saying that is because I also read the news this morning. Remember, I've been up for many, many hours, so I've been busy. Um, but uh, I've have read uh, quite a bit of news that are also talking about the fact that even with the vaccine, if it gets approved and kind of gets rolled out in early to mid 2021, it likely won't be available for all individuals well into late 21, more likely than not into 22 and 23. So that means that, you know, most places still won't be operating on the same old. So we're going to have this, you know, pandemic normal for a while, for a while. So get used to it. Plan on it, plan on it, plan on it. Private equity firm Blackstone, Spain's largest landlord, tries to unload its properties. So we're going to jump across the pond for a brief moment and also learn about what's happening with Blackstone. Now, you also understand that Blackstone has purchased many, many properties in the last crash, and they have benefited a great deal from it, becoming one of the largest landlords um, basically around the world. You know, they purchased a lot of things in United States and then, uh, you know, were, uh, you know, renting them and have sold vast majority of their portfolio. Now they're doing other business uh, where they're making money in other directions and ways, uh, thanks to the Fed. Uh, but why I digress, let's go look at what's going on in Spain. So Spain house, house prices have began to fall for the first time since 2015. Two real estate firms that private equity giant Blackstone acquired in 2017 from Banco Santander have pledged to reimburse investors up to one-tenth of the sale price if the value of properties they buy drops by more than 10% uh, in the three months after the deal is sealed. And the two companies are Aliceda and Antis uh, Anticipa. So uh, many of the 8,400 properties on, on the offer have been sitting on the market since 2018 without finding a buyer. Portfolio is valued at 1.4 billion euros. So that's what, uh, $1.5, $1.6 billion. Blackstone is trying everything it can to offload them. So very different perspective than what we're seeing here in US, where we're seeing this mad land rush happening here and prices starting to go through the roof, pricing many buyers out of it, which is probably why we're seeing the drop, like I've been talking about in the show in previous episodes, but we're seeing something a little bit different happening in Spain. Blackstone is the biggest private landlord in Spain with some 100,000 real estate assets in the country. Aliceda has already reduced its offer price before the outbreak. 
after surmising at the beginning of this year that Spain's roughly five-year housing boom was running out of steam. After the lockdown, it undertook another price review and reduction. So the prices have steadily been dropping over there. And, uh, the, you know, they were hoping to entice folks to say, hey, 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 look, it's super affordable now. You should get in. However, the intended message could potentially be giving investors the impression that some of the biggest sellers are very, very worried and likely sending a wrong message of what they wanted to say. That might be enough to convince those prospective buyers to just sit on their hands and putting the prices down even more. Remember how I talked about the whole thing of what we're seeing right now is that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy that when the prices start going up, everybody wants to pile in because you want to get it before the prices become so unaffordable that you know you can't stand it. So we go in, we pile in, which drives the prices even further. Well, opposite happens when the prices start to fall, and we're seeing this happening in Spain. The reason that I'm bringing this stuff with Spain is because this potentially, potentially could be a bit of future forecasting for United States um, for a few years down the, down the line, right? So uh, do I think it's going to happen in 21? Probably not. Maybe, maybe second part of 21, uh, more likely 22, 23. But again, we'll see. We'll see as the time continues. Uh, in the third quarter of this year, as the number of housing sales languished far below 2019 level, um, so this is a, an, an interesting piece to understand. Prices fell year over year in all but three of Spain's 18 autonomous communities, and those three being the Pelaric Islands, Canary Islands, and Asturias. The worst hit regions were La Rioja and Extremadura, where prices slumped 6.6 and 6% respectively. Two largest markets, Madrid and Barcelona, fell, uh, uh, prices fell 3.6 and 4.7% respectively and are still down 28 and 27% from their boom time peaks. And you can see what is going on in both uh, Barcelona, right, uh, right over here, and the Madrid, right? You can see that here we go. This is where we were in 2007. You know, it would come down. 2014 seemed to have been a bottom. We kind of come up, but now we're sort of turning back on down. Uh, private equity giants like Blackstone bought many of these assets at a huge discount in the wake of the last crisis. Since they were the only large market participants with enough funds on hand to buy. Of course, makes sense. The one that has the money can't afford to buy it. Um, you know, I always keep telling of the story when I was in Phoenix, um, right at, uh, you know, at the, at the beginning of the crash, uh, you know, so this was 2009. I always keep talking about this condo that I saw in Phoenix, a perfect area of Phoenix, um, and it was selling for $20,000. Uh, it was a one bedroom, one bathroom condo, nothing, you know, nothing huge, but um, fully remodeled, nothing to do with it. I mean, it was move in ready. Um, it sold in 2005 or six for $250,000, and now it was selling for $20,000 in 2009. Um, at the time, I didn't have $20,000, and nobody would mortgage you for $20,000 at that time. They did start lowering mortgage uh, qualifications and stuff in about, I want to say, 2011, something like that, maybe 2012. Uh, but in 2009, they weren't doing it. And, uh, you know, it was so painful. That was, that was a painful moment, which is why I remembered it so clearly. Now, interesting piece is that that was 2009. In 2000, maybe 12, 13, 14, something like that. So a few years later, I saw the exact, that same condo pop right back on up on market and it sold for a um, hundred some thousand dollars and now it's valued <laughs> at about 300 something thousand dollars. So if you had bought it in 2009, in 2020, uh, you would have gone from something that you paid $20,000 that is now valued at $300,000 or more. That's an insane gain, which is why I keep saying you got to be smart about how you buy, when you buy, and what you pay for what you buy. So anyways, uh, that's the sort of thing, and this is what the Blackstone and other private equity giants were doing. They were buying them super, super cheap and then basically flipping them back a few years later and renting them in the meantime. Blackstone has also become a huge player in Spain's rental market, 
and has profited from the surge in rents over those years. But conditions have changed. Since the lockdown, apartments and some possibly used as Airbnb units during the tourist boom have flooded the rental market and have pushed the rents lower. Owners of empty apartments also face the ever-present risk that the apartment could be occupied by squatters. For some, squatting is desperate less resort. For others, it's a lifestyle choice. And we actually talked about it right here on this channel um, of the fact that, you know, there are many squatters and there's a large problem in Spain with this particular thing. Now, I brought up Spain for a couple of re different reasons because A, it's probably one of the most affordable places in Europe to live and it still has a very high quality of life in my personal humble opinion. Maybe not in 2020, right? But in 2020, where can you go? I mean, maybe some of the islands, right? Some of the Caribbean, uh, maybe it sounds like Sweden, uh, right? But that's about it. Everybody else is suffering the same pain of the closures and lockdowns and all kinds of economic troubles, right? So, so that's one of the reasons that I bring it up. The other reason that I bring it up is because it could be forecasting the future for the United States, like I have mentioned. And the third reason is that it also gives me potential hope that it might make sense, maybe not right now, but it might make sense in a little while to consider, um, if you are considering international investments, to consider potentially looking at Spain. What you don't want to do is you don't want to focus on the price only. Um, the worst thing that you can do is focus on the price only in any asset class, especially in real estate. You want to focus on the location. You want to focus on the type of property and you want to have some exit plans. And of course, the pricing components of what you can do with the whole thing. All right. We're going to come back to United States now and we're going to stay in United States for the next few chapters of our conversation. My gosh, we are, I mean, it's, I told you, this is, this is packed and I do suggest and recommend that if this is like way too much stuff, watch this uh, yet one more time. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's for free. It's on YouTube. So watch it many times to be able to really understand and connect the dots here of what we're talking about. So here we go. Remember I told you we're going to be looking at this stuff that real estate prices are about to drop 10%, which is why I used the 10% in our earlier conversation. But is it going to be 10% across the board or can we expect that some prices are going to go down way further and some might actually go up? I would say yes, yes, and yes, but let's find out what they have to say. A new survey suggests that offices will remain under capacity for months. Retailing hospitality will continue to struggle and despite some increases in single family home values, real estate across the board will see its value fall around 10% next year. So that's 2021. More than 1,600 leading real estate industry experts and interviews with more than 1,300 people. So this is what's in the study, right? Pandemic is going to continue to drive major changes in the way property is bought, sold and used and overall the impact is negative and I believe overall the impact is going to last for at least next 5 to 10, maybe even more years. So it, we're in this for a very, very long haul. Okay, The real problem are isolated at this point to retail and hospitality and a fear around office. So this is where the biggest problem is. The hardest hit sectors are retail and hospitality. More than a third of respondents recommend that investors get out of Main Street retail. Two thirds say to sell stakes in regional malls. Nearly all types of retail are seen by majority of respondents as overpriced. And I will personally add to it, they have been overpriced for years now, especially nowadays. Hotels aren't much better off more resilient than retail. However, hotels aren't expected to return to pre-pandemic levels of business until 2024. All right, so this is where I got to 2024. We have uncovered the article where I read this. All right, so now you see I'm not making stuff up when I give you the information. About half of the survey respondents recommend that investors hold on to their hotel stakes. So half percent. So you have 50-50 chance if you stick with what they're saying. However, everybody's saying get out of the retail and uh, get out of the hospitality, right? So uh, the report suggests that a single family um, re rental housing will increase in demand in suburban area, particularly in the south. 
The suburban growth has been up over the past five years and it will continue. Short supplies of affordable housing are likely to be stressed even further. So this is the part that I keep saying. Is it a boom or a bust? Well, it depends. It depends on the location and the type of property. So as you can see, everybody's starting to argue or, or agree, not argue, agree that single family uh, rental units is really, really good and especially in suburb areas. And we're gonna be talking before the show ends today, even if we go over the hour mark, before the show ends today, we are going to talk about some of the top, some of the top suburban areas that you might want to consider potentially to invest in. Again, not a financial advice. You do you, I do me, and everybody is happy, but it is something that it is interesting and I think it's worthwhile mentioning and talking about. Offices may not be dead. Office tenants are likely to reconfigure their interiors. Some experts interview for the report said offices will likely remain the same size. Others said office space demand could fall by 15%. The general uncertainty about offices could mean their prices come down. Two thirds of respondents said central city office space is now overpriced. And I would argue it has been overpriced for a while. So what does this basically mean? Well, it means one of the things, so don't expect that office space is going to grow. It will likely, if it, if it remains, it will either stay the same size with probably less people going and using it or potentially going down. We're seeing many companies starting to say, you know what, we're going to continue the work from home for, you know, well into 2021. Some are saying, well, some are going to be in the office, most of them won't. Some are saying, uh, you know, we're just selling and renting everything that we have. We're not even doing it. So companies are doing different things. Of course, if it's something that is manufacturing, for example, well, you can't manufacture from home. I, I mean, I guess you could, depends on what you're manufacturing. You know, maybe you can sew face masks from home, but uh, I don't know that you can manufacture batteries, for example, inside your, you know, basement or whatever. So those employees will likely go into it, but now we're talking not offices, we are talking industrial. So let's talk about industrial. Industrial and logistics bright spot. Demand for manufacturing, warehouse, and logistics spaces is expected to continue to rise. The report suggests that these have the most positive outlook for both investments and development opportunities in 2021. So if you're looking for something that is not residential, you want to focus on the industrial complex. Um, and you know we're seeing the whole like people want to bring manufacturing and stuff. So the industrial, the manufacturing, that kind of stuff, those are the places where it might make sense to invest in and single family homes. So, and if you can find the affordable single family homes, well, even better. And if you go into the suburbs where people want to live, even better yet. And the cool part about it, well, most of us, most of us simple folk can potentially afford, not everybody can potentially afford to get into some of these deals. And of course, you can always house hack, uh, meaning you buy a duplex, triplex, or a fourplex, and then, you know, rent out the rest of the units, live in one, um, you know, not necessarily single family per se at that point, but it could potentially work out. There are other people that are using single families to house hack by living in one bedroom. It kind of potentially works maybe with like a young couple or, or a single individual, maybe not so easy with the kiddos and stuff, and then rent out uh, bedrooms to individuals out there or potentially buy something, um, you know, and rent out the bedrooms just to folks, uh, even if you don't live into it. So there's many, many ways that you can kind of play around with it. Um, it's just a matter of how creative you can be. And again, price and location matter. Now, we're talking about single family and one of the downfalls or the things that when people go into it, I know I was a victim of it, being completely transparent, is that we look at the prices of homes and we're like, oh man, this is kind of expensive. And then we look at condos and see, wait a minute, wait a minute, this is a beautiful condo. It has a pool, it has a hot tub, it has a gym, uh, and it's, uh, you know, only 100000 but the house without the pool, without the gym, without the hot tub, same size is 200000 I'm going to go with the condo. 
before you do that, there are certain things you should consider. And we are, of course, going to go right back into San Francisco to talk single family, specifically condos. So what is going on in San Francisco residential is specifically condominium stuff. So you know that it has been mass exodus out of the cities, specifically New York, San Francisco, L.A., San Diego is seeing it, Seattle is seeing it, Portland, Oregon is seeing it, Chicago is seeing it, Boston is seeing it, Atlanta is seeing it, Miami is seeing it. Name a large city and they are seeing it. Maybe not to the same extent that San Francisco and L.A. do, uh, sorry, San Francisco and New York do, but they are seeing it nonetheless. So let's learn and find out what's going on because, <coughs> excuse me, it could potentially be applicable to you where you are right now. Uh, to be able to see some common themes. So let's learn. 2,370 homes listed for sale in San Francisco in the week ended September 27th, up 73% from the same week a year ago. Two thirds of them are condos. All right, so a lot of condos are being sold. Here is what's going on. Here's where we can take a look and look at this. 17, 18, 19, pretty much the same story, right? 17 and 18. Uh, so, sorry, uh, 18 and 19 are exactly same story. 17, slightly lesser story, but follows the same kind of pattern, right? And then you get into 2020 and the pattern is broken. So condo owners, a lot of condos are putting the things on sale. A lot of condos are investment properties and those that own them decided, hey, I need to sell because Airbnb business is, is gone and rents in San Francisco are falling and people are moving out and uh, you know the rent just uh, is not enough to cover the mortgage nonetheless the HOA homeowner association fees property taxes insurance and potentially other things that also cost money when it comes to repairing stuff now condo prices are falling there was a record of 1,510 active and coming soon condo listings in the end of September, according to the MLS data. San Francisco has a population of 800,000, 880,000 uh, people in July last year, which is way before the exodus, the mass exodus began. Now, I would argue that this number is way, way less, but we may or may not know, and we probably won't know the whole truth because remember, we have stopped the census 2020. So we're not continuing with that piece. So whatever they collected, they collected. Whatever they didn't, well, there goes that. We're going to do our best and guesstimate after that. Now, Zillow lists 3,785 apartments for rent in the city, including condos for rent. Over triple the number it listed for rent during the good old times at the end of September 2016. And you can kind of see what is going on. Now, we're going to talk about the plunging rents, which I think is important. Condos, especially in high rises, are expensive to carry due to the homeowner association fees, taxes, and insurance. For example, a two bedroom, two bathroom condo is listed for $1.1 million. I think that's ridiculous, but that's just me. HOA fees, HOA fees, hold on to your chair, are $915 per month. Property taxes, $614 a month. Insurance, $385 a month. Including the mortgage, total monthly carry costs amount to $5,768. Now, it was listed for a rent a couple of years ago at $4,695 a month, which basically means that you cannot afford, you are functioning at a negative uh, $1,100, right? So you're functioning, you're losing $12,000 a year, a year, if you're renting this thing. Now, of course, we do know that the rent, that the uh, median asking rent for two bedroom apartment plunged by 20% from a year ago and 25% from a peak. So now it's not even $46.95 that you can get for this. It might be something like 3000 something, right? Which is even more. This is the reason why people are selling. And of course, now they're trying to incentivize folks to get in and incentives to fill the units are the laser sprays are, you know, three months rent free, paid utilities. You know, you, people are doing just whatever they can to get folks in. So a renter in San Francisco is now getting an awesome deal. The problem is 
There are not many people that want to rent in San Francisco. They're moving out. They want out of the place. And we've seen that California has a huge, massive exodus happening from it. And San Francisco is equally as suffering as other places. Maybe not some rural areas and stuff in, in California, but a lot of Californians are leaving. And uh, apparently there's a giant battle with all of the states next to California that are saying like, oh, God, like, you know, please don't come. Please don't come. Stay where you are. Stay where you are. We don't want you here. Uh, so they are the persona non grata um, now, you know, trying to leave California. But one of the things that you might be asking is, why would somebody do this? Why would you buy something that, you know, uh, costs you, you know, uh, say $6,000 a, a, a month to own, but only bring, you know, $4,500 or $5,000? Well, the reason the people were doing it is because they were banking on their rents going up and appreciation of the whole thing. I have been saying for years uh, that, that this is not a good way to invest. Again, you do you, I do me, not a financial advice, but it just didn't make sense to me that you would buy something, losing money in the hopes, hope and pray that something is going to happen, that those prices are going to go up, that the rents are going to go up, and at some point you're going to catch up. To me, it makes more sense that you make money from the day that you buy, and then if it goes up, hey, that's amazing. That means you're making more money, but you are taking way less risk. People are now losing money, losing shirts, and we're seeing the same thing happen now that was happening in 2007, 2008 in these particular areas. The condo prices have started to drop ever so gently. Per square foot, in quarter three, the average price fell 5% compared to the same period of last year to $1,088 per square foot. That's a very expensive square foot if you ask me personally. Median condo price fell 2% year over year to $1.25 million. That is, again, absolutely insane because you have to think about it. It's not just the price of that condo. It's also those HOA fees. You cannot, cannot negotiate the HOA fees. Once you get into the condo, hey, if the fees go up, they go up, and you got to pay them every single month. Well, it eats into your profitability, and it eats into your expenses, and it adds yet another level of risk, but that's just me. Condo prices fell 1.6% year over year and 2.1% from the May reading, which consisted largely of deals made before the pandemic. Case Shiller index for condos normally rises from May to June, but of course it has fell, and I predict it will continue to fall in the upcoming months and likely a couple of years, probably a couple of years, if not even longer. Price movements in real estate are slow and take a long time to play out. I think we need to all remember this. I'm going to repeat this yet again. Price movements in real estate are slow and take a long time to play out. During the housing bust one, which is that 27, 2008, right? Uh, from condo peak to condo throw took over five years. The chart uh, case Schiller, uh, index for condo shows that condo prices have in effect gone nowhere for the past three years similar to period between mid 2005 and 2007 all right so let's take a look you can see it it went up then it kind of hit this sort of like eh, nothing is happening but it did have a slightly downward trend trend and then we kind of came on down kept on going down hit the bottom at the end of 2011 and then it's been going up like crazy and now we're hitting yet another top now, this top is slightly different than the top in 2005 to 2007, where you can see a clear downward, whereas here we don't see that. We actually, as a matter of fact, we probably see a very clear, let me see if I can do this, very clear, let's see if the line, uh, I'm horrible at line drawing. All right, maybe I won't do this. Maybe I won't do this. Uh, but uh, you can see that it's mostly stable. It's slight up, but then kind of coming down, which if the same thing continues, right, that it took five years, that means 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. In year 2025, the prices actually might come down yet again where it might. It might make sense to buy again. 
But then again, we'll see. You know, you want to take a look at the political stuff. You want to take a look at the job stuff. You want to take a look at the economy stuff. You want to take a look at the stuff stuff. So you want to understand what's going on and not just blindly put it on your books and said, well, 2025, I'm buying a condo in uh, San Francisco. Because again, I don't know if it makes sense. Within the condo market, the high-rise segment appears to be the weakest. Supply of condos listed for sale on MLS skyrocketed to nearly eight months. Remember, we said that six-month supply is the healthy one. Right now, we are seeing that the uh, the the houses for sale um, it was you know flirting at around three to four months, and they're saying that right now it's at four uh, four point four months. Um, but you know the the eight months is very very high which means the prices are definitely going the south southern direction not like southern as in southern united states but like south as in like going down in prices here are the months of supply and inventory and you can see the condo is the red and house is the blue one and this is for san francisco market only so you can see what has happened right we've hit the super weird high we're hitting a little bit higher high than and then that time and uh, you know potentially is it potentially going to go down we don't know we don't know we'll see we'll find out only time will tell and then we can see that the homes single family has done very similar thing we've hit sort of the bottom right over here right in the 13 14 15 and uh, now we've kind of gone back up and we're starting to kind of uh, looks like turn around on the single family but condo is still straight on up so this is one of the pieces now my gosh time is flying but we still have big things to talk about and uh um you know i did promise that we're going to take a look at the stuff so let's take a look at this stuff because i don't want to go two hour show for this stuff but i did promise to do this before the end of the show so let me keep on it on this promise and then i promise we're going to continue where we stop today tomorrow to learn more about what's going on so let's make this bigger aka readable because I can't read it this small, and I know you can't either. So, there we go. This is something we can actually read. So, what has happened is that Zillow and Trulia decided to partner up and provide us with a brand new index of measurement of sitiness. It's called the sitiness index, and we're going to learn what that is right now. Top affordable U.S. suburbs with a city feel. Traditional urban amenities, restaurants, nightlife, museums, sports venues, and so on, are something that people really, really want. However, they also want to balance things with space and affordability of the suburbs while maintaining the big city feel. So, Sidness Index, called but created by Zillow and Yelp, helps identify the U.S. suburbs that best strike the balance. Housing affordability, housing availability, and a mix of diversity of businesses and consumer reviews and check-ins. So, Almost two-thirds of respondents saying they would consider moving if they had flexibility to work from home occasionally. And I think that that is probably going to happen and continue to happen. This is a new trend that we're seeing that I believe is going to continue. And we are going to see a great reshuffling on the horizon of people moving from one area into the other. And then, you know, potentially we're going to go right back into it. But this is the direction we're going in right now. So don't fight the crowd you're never going to win when the crowd goes this way whether you like it or not you're going with the crowd i'm sorry at yelp we're seeing consumer interest and requests for quote for categories like movers packing services and mortgage lenders increase in major metro areas demand is also driving up prices and depleting inventory so here are the top affordable u.s suburbs with the u.s city feel and you can see that there's quite a bit happening on the east coast there's a lot happening in the south little bit on this end over here so let's take a look waterbury connecticut is the number one winner with a typical home value of one hundred thirty nine thousand three hundred four dollars and it's thirty percent less expensive than the typical home in new haven and forty six percent less than the typical u.s home lowell mass uh price is three twenty three thousand five seventy six and while it is fairly expensive still the home values is about half of that in Boston, but it is really close to Boston. It's a close enough commute. Uh, Joliet, Illinois, typical price is $155,018. It is home to the Chicago Land Speedway, and it's 40% less expensive than typical Chicago home. Sunrise, Florida, value 243 dollars 
but it's 36% less expensive than Miami. So it's still on the pricier side, but you know, less than the less than the national average and way less than Miami. Pasadena, Texas, price $168,080, 50 miles southeast of downtown Houston, and it's 14% less than Houston prices. Lancaster, California, which is typical price at $320,000, 494. Uh, north edge of greater Los Angeles and it's less than half than uh, what you would find in Metro LA so could be a great deal if you're wanting to be close to LA but not really pay the LA prices Hampton Virginia typical home price $188,373 almost 60% less than the nearby city of Virginia Beach Marietta Georgia typical home price $318,069 20 miles northwest of Atlanta, typical home value Marietta are actually higher than Atlanta, but they're saying uh, it's, it's, it's much more affordable than some of the other areas. I was personally surprised, somebody who lived in Atlanta for a while, I was surprised to see Marietta, Georgia here, not because it's not cool, but because it is known in the city of Atlanta that Marietta can be way pricier than Atlanta. Okay, Northman, Oklahoma, typical price, $180,833, a small town atmosphere with a vibrant nightlife, generally more expensive than those in Oklahoma City, but yes, than the typical U.S. So again, this is one of those things we're seeing that the larger town is actually cheaper than this one. So do your own evaluation and uh, discovery. And in number 10 is Tempe, Arizona. Typical home price is $327,962. Located just east of Phoenix and home values are up 10% from last year. The interesting piece they did not mention in this article is that Tempe is actually higher priced than that of Phoenix. It is a home of ASU. It is actually very cool. There's a lot of things to do. As you know, I lived in Arizona for a very long time, um, you know, splitting my time between, uh, you know, down Pinal County as well as Phoenix area. Um, you know, a lot of Phoenix, a lot of Tempe, uh, Tempe, a lot of Scottsdale, and then Tucson as well. So uh, Tempe is very, very cool, but it is much pricier. Now, not as pricey as some areas of Scottsdale, but you can find very cool areas in Phoenix that potentially could be less than this. We do know one thing. I do know one thing that I can share with you right now is that prices in Arizona are really, really going on up because one major thing is happening, and that is, take a guess, take a guess, take a guess, same thing that happened in 2007 and 8, where people from Southern California are moving out of Southern California and they're landing in land of the rising sun or setting sun or the sunshine year round, whatever, Arizona. So that's one of the things. Now, methodology. Any city not including the official name of a metropolitan area as defined by the U.S. Census were counted in the suburb in this analysis. For individual Yelp indicators, they looked at mix of businesses, diversity of restaurants, nightlife, diversity of arts, and consumer activity. Zillow analyzed five main variables targeting affordability. They were looking at the affordability as compared to the principal cities and national median. They also looked at availability of sale for sale for rent and inventory. So they looked at new for sale inventory, rental inventory, and existing sale data is that you are getting from this is from june to august of 2020 so of course everything in real estate has a lagger data but i think this is very very cool and very very important so that completes the today's episode we've covered a lot we are well over an hour here i am going to stop yapping in just a second but do me a huge favor smash the like button if you're watching this on youtube do subscribe and make sure you join me tomorrow at 7 a.m eastern daylight time soon to be eastern you know night time or whatever right because we're going to change clocks in a few weeks right that's going to happen and so make sure you join me because tomorrow we're going to cover a lot of things for example we're going to be talking about what's happening with the fine uh, fine 
financializing of single family houses and why that matters to you. We're going to be looking at the mortgage delinquency rates and what's happening there. We're going to be looking at what the smart money is doing when it comes to the commercial real estate and what's happening in the commercial real estate uh, mortgages and how potentially you could think about it. So we're going to be evaluating some charts and graphs and we're going to be digging super, 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 super deep uh, because it is important. So make sure you come in. All right, y'all. We're about to go into the Q&A for those watching live. For everybody else, hey, thanks for watching. Smash the like button, subscribe, and I will see you tomorrow. Until then, stay forever money blessed. And do remember, you are only one deal away.